All right, good afternoon, folks. It's good to be back in the Lord's house today. And we are, uh, I guess we're running better in time. I just noticed we usually advertise our, um, our <coughs> Facebook Live around 3.30. Or I usually say 3.30-ish because when I talk too much, and that I can do, um, then, you know, we started 3.40, 3.45. I think we started as, as late as 4 o'clock, you know. My wife was keeping track of that and she was uh, in Costa Rica uh, watching us live. But we want to wait, welcome as always, we want to welcome our Facebook friends, our YouTube friends. And um, we're pr I'm telling you, keep, keep praying because we're making improvements and Lord willing next week we're going to have a better quality um, broadcast of the service here, of the, of the sermon and better quality sound. And uh, we're working on that and we, we got everything working except for one cable. Uh, so keep praying for that. But I want to continue with the series of sermons that I started last week. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? So today is sermon number two of that series. And by the way, uh, I never do announcements here, but I want to make one um, that in two weeks, our church is going to be celebrating our, help me out ladies, 63rd? Fourth already. Wow. Our 64th. Uh, homecoming anniversary, Amen. all right, 64 years of serving the Lord here in uh, the Miami area. Amen. I say that because we started actually in Hialeah, and then our church was located, relocated uh, in the early 70s here to uh, the Kendall uh, area of Miami. And um, so anyways, in a couple of weeks, we'll be having a special celebration, and we're going to do something completely different. I don't think we've ever done it before. We're actually going to uh, have our activities on Sunday. We're going to go to a park, a nearby park, and we're going to be giving you more details about that. Uh, so the, we're, we're, I don't know exactly how, but you're going to still have the live uh, from wherever we're at. All right, and we'll, we'll do that. So I may not be wearing a suit. I promise you I won't. Sometimes I don't even wear a suit here. So you're, you're, you're blessed I've been wearing it the last three weeks. I know because I looked at the pictures. Remember I told you, I have to look at the pictures and see what I wore last week to see what I'm wearing today. And I don't look like a picture. But anyways, uh, to make this uh, more serious, um, so we're, we'll, we're going to keep you posted because we want you to come and, and you know join us in this awesome celebration. We're going to have a, a family picnic. And uh, we're going to have that on Sunday. We're probably going to get started uh, sometime earlier than we usually have our service, all right? So we're gonna have different activities that day. All right, that being said, sermon number two of the series, Where Is Your Heart? And I want to uh, read two verses that we read last week. And the first one is Matthew chapter six, in verse 21. And this is kind to, uh, this is actually going to be um, the, the, the basis, if you will, uh, the foundation for this series of sermons. All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. And the other verse that I want to read is where I left off last week in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 13. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And I want you to repeat after me. I never do this, but please repeat after me. God is my strength. God is my strength. God is my source of supply. God is my source of supply. Not my substance. Not my substance. I will not strengthen myself with my substance. God is my strength. God is my strength. Join me in prayer, please. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, as we continue. With this series, where is your heart? I want to ask you, Lord, that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit that we may comprehend the word that, is, that we're about to study. We ask you that you would uh, just open our minds, open our hearts, help us to avoid any and all distractions uh, so we can concentrate for the next few minutes, Lord, in the word of God. And we ask you that you would uh, grant me the wisdom that I need to present this material in the best way possible. And Lord, if there's anybody that is listening to my voice that does not know you as personal Savior yet, we ask that that person would be saved, that you would convict that heart in such a heavy way that they cannot walk away without trusting you as personal Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, where is your heart? 
The Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So that's the key. If you haven't uh, figured that out already, we're trying to see, okay, where, where is our heart? Well, where your treasure is? Well, that's easier said than done. But, but, but I'm, I'm trying to give you certain uh, tools, if you will, to find, you know, because the Bible says that our heart is, is kind of tricky sometimes, right? It, it's deceiving. And, and sometimes we think that, that we got this. We think that we know what we're doing, and we really don't. And so that's, that's what we want to get to the bottom of, all right? So, folks, when things are not happening, it's always the heart. When things are not happening, it's always the heart that needs to be examined. Amen. Remember that. When things are not happening, it's always the heart that needs to be examined. As one of my mentors say, or says, it's never a money problem, it's a heart problem. A lot of times we, we, we are used to think, oh, oh, it's because money. I, oh, I don't have enough money. That's always, it's easy to blame, right? Everybody says it. And, and let's be honest. Okay, yeah, sure. Everybody could probably use a, a couple more dollars, right? But that's not to say that we should use that as an excuse like most people do. Amen. All right? Including us. We use that as an excuse too much. So it's never a <laughs> money problem. It's a heart problem. Folks, you need to ask yourself, What's the heart of this issue? The center of this problem. The center of this issue. Whatever you might be going through. What is the center of it? What's the issue? Folks, the center of it may not be that you're not giving. Listen to me. I know that sometimes the problem is you're not giving. I mean, if you're not giving to the Lord, then don't expect Him to bless you back. That's, that's like simple math, all right? That's just the way it works. If you, if, if, listen, if you don't make deposits in the bank, then don't expect that bank account to come back on a positive uh, balance. I mean, does that make sense? Don't expect to go to the ATM like our kids expect. Oh, you can just go in and put your, that little plastic thing right inside that little machine and then it, it spits out cash, Dad. That's how it works. Well, they don't know that before you can make that quote unquote magic happen. Uh, somebody has to put, uh, you know, make a few deposits for that to happen, right? And whether it's, uh, you know, your employer, your employer or, or your clients or whatever, uh, you need to put money in, right? And so, folks, it's the same thing with the Lord. But the center of the problem may not necessarily be that you're not giving, all right? And I've seen this. The center of it may be your motive for giving. I want you to listen to me on this. It may be your motive for giving, or it may be deception on repentance. That is when you, you, you repent, and you think you've repented, but not really. What, what, how, does that, how does that work? Well, sometimes we feel that we have repented, and we feel like that, that, that issue has been solved, but not really, because it wasn't really from the heart. All right? And there's a series of sermons that we just finished uh, right before Christmas time about this forgiving and repentance. It could be the condition of your heart, which is why everything else is not working right in our lives. You see? It's a heart issue. But folks, it is up to us. When everything else is not working in our lives, it is up to us to go and understand that in order to find the issue, we've got to start with the heart first. That's where it starts. I, I, I think cars a lot, all right? Because I like cars. I like I like stuff that, you know, has a motor and stuff. Now I'm into motorcycles. I've always liked them, but now I kind of revived that. And, 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 you know, when you hear a strange noise coming from, you know, under the hood, you don't go in the back and check the trunk. I mean, it doesn't make sense. If you hear a weird noise coming from, you know, from inside the hood, then you go and and open the hood. You know, you will hope. Stop first and turn it off, whatever. But you know, you go and check where the noise is coming from. The heart of the vehicle has been said that to be the motor, the engine, right? And we know that if that engine is fried, if it doesn't work, if, if it's no good, most uh, likely it's not worth fixing. Now and not nowadays, a lot of times it's cheaper to go and and just. Trade in that car for junk or whatever, and they'll work with you a deal, right? And, and it's a, a lot of, you know what I mean? A lot of times it's not even worth trying to go and overhaul an engine like we used to do back in the day. Mm -hmm. All right? And so, but, but you see, 
the heart. You look for the problem. You want to solve the issue. So it's up to us when everything else is not working in our lives to go and understand that in order to find the issue, we've got to start with the heart first. And no, not, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but I, it wasn't an accident, all right? I know that. It's, we, need, we need to hear this stuff over and over again. And I will be saying some of these phrases, uh, sometimes a little bit differently, or sometimes you may hear the exact same phrase, and you'll be like, didn't he say that five minutes ago? All right? So, yes, it's on purpose. Now, when we can repair the issues of the heart, then things will work right. Just like when you go to the mechanic and you get your car fixed, well, guess what? Once you drive out of there and you've paid him, especially after you paid him that huge bill, you hope that you're not going to hear that weird noise again, right? You hope that your, you know, your steering wheel is not going to be wobbly all over the, 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 the road again. You're, you hope that the problem is solved, absolutely, right? I mean, when you press on the brakes, you want the car to stop. You, you want, you know, you press on the gas, you don't want to hear any weird noises because that's what you pay the mechanic to do. So, folks, if you want to solve the issues of the heart, then let's do it. And we got to do it right. All right? That's what we're trying to find out here in this series of sermons. Lots of inexperienced preachers take this message and they reduce it to just plain stuff. Now, God was a good God before you got this stuff. Mm. God was a good God when you didn't have this stuff. Amen. And God is a good God, not, not based on this stuff, not based on the harvest, not based on any of that. God is a good God before all that God started. He's always been good, amen? Amen. Whether we get the toys and we get the stuff or we don't. As Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. Whether we have abundance or we don't. He's still good. Amen. God is good. Amen. So when the stuff came. It's because you believed that God was a good God to begin with. See your heart was correct. I think most of us can attest to that, right? We've, we've experienced the blessings of God. Well, we all have, whether you realize it or not. My point is, you, you know, to some extent, we've all experienced this. Some of you may say, well, Pastor, I, I, I don't have that much experience in this. Well, you have. What you need to do is realize that you have been through this process before, right? And God was good before and during and after you got the stuff. That's why you got the stuff, because God is good, amen? amen? But you see, our mentality, our mindset is has been messed up a lot of times in that we think that when we get the stuff, oh, now God is good. Of course. What about when you're lacking that stuff? You're not too happy, are you? You know? And so we have to be careful, folks. We cannot be placing our focus on the material things like the world does. We have to be very careful of that. Everything with God is a heart issue because God weighs the heart. God's not looking at your clothing or your intentions or my intentions were good. God's weighing your heart. I meant well. Well, if you meant well, then look up what God wants and do it right. And what I'm talking about is a lot of people come to God with, with, with the wrong worship, with the wrong offerings. We, we go back in the Old Testament and you look at two brothers, right? Adam and Eve had, had two kids. And then one of them, what happened? He brought the wrong type of sacrifice. And a lot has been said that, oh, well, the thing about Cain is that his sacrifice had all kinds of rotten fruits and vegetables. That's not what the Bible says. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. The problem is he brought the wrong type of sacrifice. As a matter of fact, that, that was not a sacrifice. That was an offering. And there was a place and time for that type of offering. All right? For the first fruits. But that's not what it was required at this time. God wanted a sacrifice. That's why he looked, you know, to um, uh, uh, Abel's sacrifice with, with pleasure. It was... It was, it was uh, uh, the fragrance of that was, was pleasant in his presence. That was the word I was looking for. It was pleasant before his presence, you know, in, in his eyes. So we need to be careful. 
Because it's not a matter of, oh, but I'm, I'm doing this. You know, God knows my heart. Well, exactly. Because God knows our heart. We need to be very careful. We can't, we can't mess it up, folks. If a man intends to do something and he never gets around to doing it, it is a matter of character. It's a matter of his heart. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 with me, please. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. <clears throat> Philippians 2, 13. <clears throat> excuse me. It says, for it is good, excuse me, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, think about this. Jesus used the young man's possessions in Mark chapter 10, verse 22. He used his possessions to locate his heart. He located his heart by locating where his treasure was. Remember? Now, let's look at Luke chapter 18 with me. Verses 29 and 30, please. Look in your Bibles. Luke 18, verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> Excuse me. Luke chapter 18, verses 29 and 30. You there yet? Yep. Amen. It says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Please notice that Jesus said, for the kingdom of God's sake. In other words, for the sake of the kingdom. Right? Yeah. Good English. For the sake of the kingdom. Now, what would you be willing to do for the sake of the kingdom of God? Mm. Think about it. What would you be doing or would you be willing to do for the sake of the kingdom of God? The Bible promises it's not going to be an unrewarded sacrifice for the kingdom of God's sake. He, in the passage here, he was talking about uh, oh, I lost my spot. Um, houses or parents or you know brethren or, or wife or children. The normal stuff that people worry about, right? Oh, I can't, I can't go in the mission field. I cannot answer a call to preach. I, I, can't, I, I don't want my kids to, to go to Bible school and become preachers and missionaries and, 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 and pastors and whatnot because there's no, there's no money in that, you know? And people all the time reject the call, I'm afraid, for the love, you know, of money because they don't want to go without but the Bible promises that it's not going to be an unrewarded sacrifice for the kingdom of God's sake. So at the end of our lives, God is going to ask, what did you do for the kingdom? What did you do for the kingdom? And many Christians say that if they had a million dollars, they would do this and that for the kingdom of God. I've heard a few myself. Oh, if I had this amount of money, if I had a million dollars, I would do this and that for the kingdom of God. When we had, you know, our school ministry and all kinds of stuff before, and we had all kinds of debt as well, and the mortgage payment and so on and so forth, I actually heard a, a few of our church members in the past say stuff like that. Oh, if I, you know, if I won the lottery, if I... That's another subject on its own. But I heard him say stuff like that. Oh, if I won the lottery, yeah, if I had this money and this and that, or if I if I had this inheritance, or if, you know, if I had a million dollars, kind of thing, I would pay the church's debt. I would, you know, build the church's uh, in the auditorium. I would fix the church's roof. It was a bad roof back then. I, would, you know, I heard a few of those. But folks, let me tell you something. That's easy to say when you don't have a million dollars. But what are you going to do with the $2 that you do have in your pocket? Right. 
That's the question. You see, God is not demanding for us what we don't have. That just plain, you know, makes sense. He's not asking me to give an account of what he doesn't, what he hasn't given me. But he wants to know, what am I going to do? Well, I don't have my wallet, but left them in the car. But I, what, what am I going to do with those 10 20 $30, whatever it is that I have in my wallet? What, what are you going to do with the, with, with the $10, a few hundred dollars, whatever it is, a few thousand, whatever you have in your bank account? That's what, that's what he's, he wants to know. Right. You know? That, that's what he wants to do. To know, what are you going to do with the next paycheck? If you get a, 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 you know, a tiny paycheck or, or if you're like me, you, know, you own your own business and sometimes you don't know where your next check is coming from or whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, what are you going to do with that? That's what God wants to know. It's easy to say that I'm going to do this and that with the money you don't have. Or worse, when you're thinking about somebody else's money, I've seen that as well. Mm. Oh, if I had the money of brother so-and-so. Or if I had the business of brother so-and-so. If I had, you know what I have heard? If I had the family of brother so-and-so. Mm. What? Now you're coveting his wife and his kids? Are you serious? Mm. Well. Or if I, car, if I had, you know, such and such a you know, car because it's so reliable and this and that, and I mean, you know, in time for all the certain, it goes on and on and on and on. You get the point. But folks, it's a principle. If you can't be faithful to God's, or I'm sorry, I should have changed that word on my notes. If you won't be faithful to God's kingdom with the little that you've got now, mm. then he will not bless you more because you will, not, uh, you will be in a worse situation if he did. If you won't use the $2 you have now for the kingdom, if you won't use the whatever you call the little time or the little this or the little that you know, for the Lord now, what makes you think he's going to give you more? He won't. Because if he did, you'd be in a worse, you know, in, in, in a worse situation that you are. Because you cannot manage the little. I was telling, I think I was telling Megan the other day. I remember my good friend, Pastor Simpson, when, uh, how old the Simpson now, Sam? What? I mean, Winston. What is six last name is sixteen? About sixteen. Now this kid is like seven feet tall right now. He looks, like, he looks like ten feet tall to me, right? Every time I see him, I'm like, bro, stop growing. He's taller and taller. You know how that goes. When that kid was like five years old, if that, I remember Pastor Simpson one time he made a illustration. He says, Listen, I love my, my, my son. He was talking about the little one. He has two. He says, I love my son so much. But you know, if I gave him Back then, if I gave him a hundred dollars, you know, to go shopping, we go to the supermarket, and I give him a hundred dollars, I say, okay, Winston, you can go buy whatever you want in the supermarket with a hundred dollars. He asked us, what do you think he would buy? Uh, obviously, he would buy, you know, cookies and candy and chocolate, right? All the all the good stuff, right? All the stuff that we husbands we know how we know we we men know what to do, right? What to get? All the healthy stuff, right? Our, our wives still don't buy that, but they still the healthy stuff. But anyway, he says, now, why won't I do that? Well, obviously, because I love my kid more than that. So I'm not going to give him $100 to go and buy all the stuff that's going to be bad for him. And he was making an illustration about why God will not give us sometimes, you know, that big fat check that we want because we don't know how to spend it. We're like a five-year-old in a candy store, right? right? And so think about that, folks. If we cannot be faithful with the little that we have now, whatever we call little, think about this. What you and I in America call little, mm. you know, in other countries, we're millionaires. Mm. Yeah. Just think about that. Amen. You know, just think about that. It's all relative. Amen. And you know what? When we can't be faithful to God's kingdom with the little, all right? And, and then, then, you know, like I said, he cannot bless us with more because we'd be in a worse situation if he did. And that's called fabricated intentions. You know, to predict it, to project 
the image of what you would do if you had more money or more time or more resources, whatever it might be. That's called fabricated intentions. And it's all up in our head because it's not real. Because you may not have that million dollars. If you did, you wouldn't be making those plans, would you? Lots of people do the right thing for the wrong reasons. That's another thing. We're looking at where is your heart. So think about this. Lots of people do the right thing for the wrong reasons. For example, many people come to God, that's good, but they come so that he will give them a new car or a new house or a new job or a new business or maybe more clients or whatever. But that's wrong. So they're doing something good coming to God, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. When you have the wrong reasons to do something, even if it's the right thing, you won't keep doing it. You'll quit. You'll quit. And folks, remember that old phrase, winners never quit and quitters never win. Mm. But you know, I've seen many people with their own hidden agenda. What are you talking about, Pastor? Their life's agenda. Hidden agenda, their own life, their, their own life agenda. And you know, when that is not met, then they shrink and melt away and they quit. Some are not even in the ministry anymore because I didn't get what I wanted out of it. We can't come to the Lord with our own agenda, folks. So I want to ask you to think, what do you want? What do you want? Ask yourself this. Am I worshiping God because I love him? Or do I have an agenda? Mm. And that's something that we should all ask ourselves. Why am I approaching the throne of God? The throne of grace? Do I have an agenda? Or am I just sincerely worshiping the Lord? Amen. Why are we giving tithes and offerings? Because we want to get something in return? Or because we just love him so much and we're, we're just... In you know being thankful and we're just saying Lord I'm appreciative of everything that you've given me I'm giving you a small portion of so many things that you've given me already and I'm just going to return a few you know a few dollars here for you Amen. in return what's your agenda if you have one hope you're not or hope you don't some people do it because oh I heard that God can get you out of debt mm -hmm. mm. So here I am. Of course he can get you out of debt. He can do all kinds of stuff. But is that your motivation to give him? Is that your motivation to come? Is that your motivation to, uh, I don't know, to pray, to read the scriptures, to, to fast, to, uh, you know, to bless others, to, to help the poor, to, uh, to, to give to uh, great causes? I'm, I'm pointing here, folks can't see it. Uh, the uh, coin bank for the tracks that we spoke about a couple weeks ago. It's good. Why, why are we doing this? Ask yourself, what have you done for the kingdom? What have you done for the kingdom? Because that will determine what happens in your life. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 14, please. 2 Chronicles, from the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 14 says, And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants. That walk before thee with all their hearts. You see, you can't serve God with all your heart without serving Him with your treasure. You just can't. You can't say, oh Lord, I love you with all my heart. And then when someone asks you if you believe in tithing, you say, no, I don't. That's deception. That's like me saying, oh, I love my wife, I love my wife, I love my wife, when she was in Costa Rica for four months. 
And then when she comes back, I treat it like whatever. Like she doesn't even matter. It doesn't work like that. We gotta be careful, folks. We, there's gotta be, what's the word I'm looking for? Agreement. An agreement between our words and our actions, right? What we say has to agree with what we do. We can't just say, oh, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord. And then I don't give them anything. I don't give them all my time, I don't give them my, my money, I don't give them all of my resources, I don't give them anything. It doesn't work like that. Remember, he has tied your treasure with your heart. He said that. It was him that said that. He can find where your heart is by following and trading your treasure. You've got to make the kingdom of God the center of your life. And then God will keep and show covenant and mercy to you. This verse that I just read to you, it says that he will keep covenant and show mercy unto his servants. And then he defines, and I underlined it, those that walk before you with all their hearts. I want to walk before the Lord with all my heart. But my heart is deceiving sometimes. I can't even figure it out myself. I need the Lord to help me. I need the Holy Spirit to come and dissect my heart. Amen. And let me know what's going on in my heart. Amen. Like when you take your car to the mechanic and say, Lord, hey, excuse me. Hey, listen, Mr. Mechanic, my, 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 the engine in my heart, the, the heart of my car, the engine is making a weird noise. Figure it out, please. Like we got to fix this. It's the same thing. I can't figure out my heart. Lord, show me my heart. Show me the intentions of my heart because I want to be, you know, real. I want to make sure I do things right. I don't want to have a hidden agenda. I want to, I want to be sincere. I want to be open. I want him to be able to show covenant and mercy to me. I want to be that faithful servant. If you want to do the same with, you know, as, as, as I'm saying, well then make the kingdom of God the center of your life and he will show you covenant and mercy. Simple as that. Here are some scriptures that talk about how God searches and tries the hearts of men. Acts chapter 1 and verse 24 says God knows our hearts. Acts 21, 1 and 24. 1 Chronicles 28 and 9. The Lord searches all hearts. That was 1 Chronicles 28 and 9. Proverbs 17 and 3. God tries the hearts. God tries the hearts. I can already see a couple of you asking me for a copy of this. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2 is an example of this that I just said. It says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. That was Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. Did I lose you? Acts one twenty four. 1 Chronicles 28, 9, and Proverbs 17 and 3. This last one that I actually did read was Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. Folks, sometimes pressure can show what we're really made of. And sometimes organizations have a process that they put you through to see what you're made of, right? And I've been a part of a couple of organizations. One of them was actually a youth ministry years ago. And they would put the leaders through some rigorous uh, just situations, I guess, if you can call it that, through the different activities, through you know, summer camps that we had and different things. And, and you know, if you, if you said that you wanted to become a leader or something, they would put you through some, some kind of testing and whatnot. But it was all good. It was to see what you were really made of. You see? It's just like when we squeeze a lemon to make lemonade. Well, sometimes God will allow circumstances in our lives that will kind of squeeze us in order to teach us and test us. And then 
get the best out of us. Like it's done in many fields of professional studies, right? Uh, any area of life that's really worth something. But folks, quitting is never an option. You don't quit when things get hard, right? You'll never accomplish anything. Faithfulness is not faithfulness until it passes the test of faithfulness. I mean, what can I say? That's just the way it works. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? I want to finish with a couple more thoughts. Everything God does, He's going to do it on the basis of where you position your heart. And that's why I keep asking, where is your heart? Where is your heart? You see, today, we find that a lot of church members do the outside things first. Instead of doing the spiritual things first. Remember Jesus asked, or Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things that we're so worried about will come. In God's timing, right? They'll come. You see, God is looking for the genuine, not, the manip not our manipulation. Manipulation. He's looking for the genuine, not our manip manipulation. A little tongue twister. If your intention is not to honor and worship God, but to get something, then you'll find yourself trying to manipulate God. If you do things in order to obtain something back, then you will not last very long doing it. I already said that like five minutes ago. You just won't last. You cannot be consistent. You're not going to be persistent on doing something if your intention is to manipulate God. The greatest achievement when you're in the process of attaining or reaching a goal is not what you obtain from it, but what you become through it. If you're doing the right things for the wrong reasons, you won't do it very long. And not only will you not do them very long, but you'll find that you won't obtain any results anyway, at least not the result that you were expecting. So you're de deceiving yourself. Can you imagine spending your whole life just spinning the wheels and doing all kinds of stuff and it's like you're in a rut? You know, you see all these little animals that, that go on, the, on that little spinning wheel and that's all they do, spin the wheel. Mm -hmm. Now they're dumb, they don't know anything. <laughs> now my dog, my dog is dumb. But I'm telling you, if, he, if I had a speed course, that would be a big spinning wheel. That dog is 96 pounds. I, I'm almost positive. I hope I'm wrong. But, or I hope I'm right. I'm almost positive. As dumb as my dog is, I don't think he can, I don't think you'll entertain him on that spinning wheel for too long. His dog's no better. I think. Now, my dog is so dumb, he may not pass the test, Brother Gary. You may find him there until the Lord comes, you know? I don't know. But all kidding aside, folks, a lot of times we spend our, our lives like those little dumb animals on, on a spinning wheel. They're active, but they're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. Very active. Well, I'm sure they go they get tired and they go they go they go to bed tired. Are you going to bed tired? Are you tired? One of my mentors says, okay, you're tired. Are you productive? Are you productive? Are you being productive or are you just active? Doing all kinds of stuff, running around, you know, like a chicken with the head cut off. Some of us do that, right? We're running around like a chicken with the head cut off and all this stuff, but are we being productive? Are we accomplishing something? Are we getting somewhere? Are we doing something? And of course, everything that I'm talking about is, are we done doing something for the kingdom of God? Not just everything that pleases the world outside. Not everything that, you know, the world says, oh, yeah, that's what we, that's what we need to do. See, the world outside, folks, sees what we're doing in here as an option. And to them, it's not even a very smart one. To them, you and I are mad. As in like mad crazy. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, right? <coughs> to the world, the things that are spiritual 
our madness. They think we're crazy. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's it. Now I know. Yeah, they lost it. Oh, now he's going to church and everything. Oh, boy. <laughs> but what? Oh, now he wants to be a preacher. Oh, wow. What can I say? But are we to please them? Amen. Or him? Amen. I mean... <clears throat> In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says that you ask and you receive not because you ask for the wrong motives. And I'm going to finish here. Wrong motives. That's what we've been talking about. And we're going to continue talking about this next week, Lord willing. But I don't want to finish without giving you an invitation opportunity. I don't know if you're if you're saved. I don't know if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I mean, I'm talking about all this. And, and, and like I said earlier, some people may, may reduce this sermon and think it's all about money. Oh, he wants money. And he's, for money. he's raising funds. I'm not raising funds. I'm not raising funds. This, this message is not about money. It's actually about a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot more than just money. Money's an important part of our lives. That's why people are so, you know... Hesitant to share it and to give it. But this is not about money. It's about the heart. Where is your heart? And if you're already thinking that, that, that I'm preaching about money, then that tells me where your heart is. That, that tells you where your heart is. I don't need to know where your heart is. I don't care where your heart is. You need to know where your heart is. So you can get it right, right with the Lord. But if you are listening to my voice, if you're watching this video, if you're here today, if you have not trusted Jesus Christ's personal Savior, then that's the decision you need to, to make right now. That's my advice. I mean, I can't tell you what to do, but you need to trust Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Jesus was sent so that he could not only live a perfect life, but die for us on that cross. And he, and he paid the price for our sin so that we could come and repent of our sins and, and come before him. And he promised to be our Savior. Our eternal Savior. Give us eternal life. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's in John 3, 16. That's the message we preach. That's why we do all this that we do. Amen. Mm -hmm. And after we trust Jesus Christ, then we join a church that is scriptural, that preaches the word, and, and we continue serving him, or we start serving him. Amen. So Jesus comes. What, what, what are we doing? We're trying to make more disciples for him. Not for us. For him. So if you have not trusted Jesus Christ's personal Savior, I want to invite you to do that. If you don't know what, what to do or how to do it, contact us. Please reach out to us. We want to meet you. We want to talk to you. We want to have you here. God bless you.